Welcome to the May 2019 Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lucas Van Sweeten, who's actually a serial snock presenter, which is good. <laughs> and Lucas is presenting on one of um, the more requested topics uh, for snock, uh, organic amendments. Uh, but before we get on to that, uh, there's a bit of background about those about him for those of you who don't know him. Lucas is a Senior Principal Research Scientist here at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and an Adjunct Professor at Southern Cross University. He's also the leader of the Integrated and Precision Soil Management Solutions Program for the current Soil CRC. And in 2006, he was awarded the New South Wales Premier's Award for Public Sector Science and Engineering. His uh, research int interests include carbon, nutrient cycling, soil function, ecotoxicology and the impacts of agricultural chemicals, management practices and climate change on soil resilience. And as I said, today is presenting on one of our more requested topics, unravelling the role of organic amendments in modern agriculture. And thank you, Abby, for the introduction and also thanks everyone for attending this morning. Um, just as a bit of background, uh, a couple of years ago, Johannes Lehmann from Cornell asked me to organise and edit a special edition for nutrient cycling in agroecosystems. And that special edition was published uh, late last year. And it essentially focused on the long-term role of organic amendments in agriculture. And my presentation today really is just taking some of the the key snippets that uh, that I learnt from that uh, from that special edition. We're, I'm not showing any any new information today that, uh, that that we've published from our team. It's essentially a, a literature review and a, a bit of a detailed meta analysis of uh, of some of the key data from around the globe. Okay, Abby. So my slide is not forwarding at the moment. Oh, okay. Yep, I've got it now. Sorry. Thank you. So pre-webinar, um, there was a request that I have a bit of a chat around policy and, uh, and some of the how-tos for composting industry. Unfortunately, I really can't cover that today. A, I don't have time and probably someone like Mark Watmuff is, uh, is better positioned to, uh, to talk about that topic. But what I am covering is a little bit of a brief history on the role and use of organic amendments. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction about what meta-analysis actually can achieve. And then I will present uh, some of the key findings, as I mentioned earlier, uh, from that special edition. And at the end, I give a few of my own perspectives and best bets for organic amendments. So there has been recently published evidence that organic amendments have been used you know, for many, many thousands of years. And uh, these are some grain samples that were um, um, that archaeology uh, student found. And uh, they showed that using stable isotope uh, methodologies of nitrogen, that uh, these particular grains were fertilized by manure. And you know, that's not unsurprising. You know, we, we have all heard and, and seen um, you know, manure is being used as fertiliser products. The first written evidence of compost being used apparently was around about 2300 BC. So there is a very long uh, history of use of organic amendments for growing food. However, I guess one one of the things that um, that, uh, that, that really put a bit of a, a change in the way we, we do agriculture was around about 1913, the Haber-Bosch process was scaled up. And that particular process now produces vast quantities of nitrogen fertiliser, essentially being able to replace organic amendments. So up until, I guess, you know, the 1900s, organic amendments were the main source of, uh, of, of nitrogen fertiliser for farming systems. That, along with a few mined ores and other products. But uh, yeah, certainly by 1913, uh, the use of, uh, of nitrogen from, uh, from the Haber-Bosch uh, really, uh, really took off. And we can see there that the, the, that rapid increase in use of vast quantities of nitrogen. I think uh, last year is around about 12 million tonnes of, of nitrogen fertiliser were applied globally, which is a, a significant quantity. I also came across some pretty interesting 
um, early uses of organic amendments. So here we can see a patent from 1874 where they talk about fertilizers from night soil. Um, and you know, that's essentially biosolids. Um, there's a patent in, again in the US from 1881 using composts and organic amendments for restoring worn out lands. And that was the actual name of the patent. So it was quite interesting that you know, even back then they recognized that soil degradation was an issue and that organic amendments definitely had a role in, uh, in addressing uh, degraded soils. And in 1905, I found a, 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 there was a, a, an interesting patent using compost as a carrier for nitrogen and potassium based fertilizers. And the reason I'm saying that's interesting is that there's still a fair bit of, uh, of research interest around using organic amendments as, uh, as carriers for, uh, for fertilizers. So, you know, I guess early scientists and early practitioners were, were thinking about these, uh, these particular topics many, many years ago. One of the issues with having a look at the literature and where we're currently sitting with, um, with organic amendments is that there are literally thousands and thousands of studies assessing organic amendments. And one of the issues is that there is a vastly varying response and it's actually quite difficult to distill some of the key, key results. And because of that, we need to Work, use methodologies to aggregate the data, work out what some of the average differences are. And meta-analysis is one of these tools that allows us to identify and criti critically appraise all of that relevant evidence. So rather than trying to understand, you know, thousands of papers, we can actually distill that data down into some key, key results uh, if we ask the right questions. One of the aspects, I guess, that we need to consider from meta-analysis is that there are always going to be outliers. So these give the average results with, uh, with error bars, but there's always going to be outliers from that, um, uh, from that meta-analysis. And it doesn't mean that either the meta-analysis or a particular study is incorrect if there are uh, differences. And here, e or here are some of the papers that were in that particular uh, special edition in nutrient cycling in agroecosystems. Um, I can send through the link to that paper uh, later on if anyone's interested. Okay. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now on a paper that was uh, that I asked Marta Camps, she's based in New Zealand, and Balwant Singh from University of Sydney to write. And basically I asked them to undertake a meta-analysis on the long-term effects of organic amendments. So as I mentioned before, there are many papers, but none of them have really pulled together the, the, that international literature in trying to understand what the overall effects are. So during that process, they um, discovered 1,300 papers that have been published on the longer term effects of organic amendments. To make it a little bit more palatable, they restricted the data to cropping. So there's no horticulture, no horticultural um, applications of, uh, of organic amendments in this particular assessment. And they assessed the four crops, barley, wheat, rice, and corn. And the organic amendment categories that they included were manure, straw, green manure, biosolids, and composted domestic wastes. Um, and within each of those categories, they could be either um, composted or non-composted. And I guess the key criteria is that the studies had to be running for a minimum of 10 years. And we weren't interested in you know, a one-off field trial uh, where you get to highly varied results. We, don't, we were quite interested here in actually seeing what that longer term impact was. And overall, there were 132 manuscripts that met the quality criteria for all of those aspects above, i.e. Um, that use controls, had standard errors within their, uh, within their data set. And they were able to extract 541 experimental data sets, which when you're doing a meta-analysis is actually considered to be a, a exceptionally strong data set. So it's a very, essentially a very reliable data set. And a meta-analysis is actually a fairly simple equation at the end of the day. So you have a response ratio and you have your control. So your control is, is um, uh, always considered uh, zero and then you have an effect of your treatment. So here you can see the dotted line. 
is basically showing a 120% increase in yield. This was just a, a, an example that I, I presented. So that's basically just the, the, the way that I'm going to be presenting some of this data now around the various aspects of the organic amendments. So they did a map of where these long-term studies were, and here we can see the distribution. I was actually quite uh, disappointed that there were no long-term studies in Australia on organic amendments that were uh, published and that met the quality criteria. So there were a lot of uh, studies in, in Japan, uh, China, uh, across Europe, and in the Americas as well. So uh, there are uh, a, a good range of, of studies that, uh, that were used in this particular uh, meta-analysis. Okay, here I'll start with some of the data. Now, before I go on, i just like to point out here again that this is a control zero and this is a response ratio here. The overall response ratio at this particular one is an 80% increase in yield. What we've done here is we've had a look at the four different crops. There's barley, rice, maize and wheat. And these blue points, so that middle section is the average and the whiskers on either side are the bootstrapped 95% confidence intervals. So where you have um, error bars that overlap, these two data sets, the rice and the maize, for example, are not statistically different. However, here, the rice, because the error bar doesn't overlap with either the, the, the maize or the wheat, um, that would be statistically lower than the results for these particular um, um, uh, uh, crops. So what we have here is the organic amendment. So we've aggregated all of the organic amendments here. So it might be the, the, the composted um, biosolids, it might be the green waste. We've had, we've had a look at the aggregated organic amendments and we've compared the yield to a nil amendment control. So that is basically a nil fertiliser control was used in these particular set of studies. And what we can see is that where an organic amendment is used, and this particular slide doesn't cover items like rate or organic amendment type or quality, but where we've used an organic amendment, we've had roughly an 80% increase in yield compared to adding uh, no fertilizer, uh, zero fertilised control which is a significant improvement in, in productivity. However, where the organic amendment is matched against a nutrient input control, i.e. the controls actually include nutrients to match the nutrients being supplied by the organic amendments, there is actually no impact whatsoever on the yield. And in fact, with barley, there was a very slight decrease um, it was significant, but it's a very, very small quantity decrease in yield when there was an organic amendment used. So this is actually quite an important data slide. So basically what it says is that the organic amendments, the key outcomes of the organic amendments on yield is based on its nutrient input. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further and, and unpackage some of this information over the next few slides. And it, it, we, we, we tease out a slightly different story to that one that I've just given there. What is very interesting is that when we have a look at um, other aspects, so this is, for example, years of application, and we have a particular practice being used for more than 20 years or a particular practice being used for 10 or for between 10 and 20 years, the averages actually still remain the same. So the net increase in yield on this side is compared to the zero um, nutrient control, and on this side is compared to the matched nutrient control. What we do see here is that the longer you implement the practice, the greater effect it has on yield. So basically, that's why we were quite interested in this particular study to look at this long-term data. And it shows that the longer you apply the organic amendments for, the greater the impact on yield is going to be. And although not statistically different, there, were, there was a, a very slight uh, indication uh, where there is matched nutrient that over time, sort of 
over 20 years that the organic amendments actually were starting to improve yield. We can break down again this effect. Again, this side, the left hand side, is versus the, the, the zero nutrient control, and the right hand side is versus the, the matched nutrient control. Again, 80% improvement, net improvement in yield, but we can break it down to have a look at the different organic amendments. So here we can have a look at either the green manure or composted green manure or smack bang on the average. However, when straw was used in, as an organic amendment, we had more variability in the data, but also the average increase was much greater than, uh, than the other organic amendments. With biosolids, although there still was a significant improvement compared to the control, that improvement was nowhere near as great as these other organic amendments. And the manures again um, uh, gave, gave an average increase in yield. When we have a look at the matched nutrient input controls, um, what's quite interesting here is that the biosolids actually gave a statistically significant but relatively small decrease in yield uh, across all of these studies. Okay, what we can have a look at here are a couple of other factors from these uh, 132 or 134 studies. So we can have a look at the organic application dose. So this is in tonnes per hectare. So more than 10 tonnes per hectare, five to 10 tonnes or below five tonnes per hectare. And it's basically per year as well. So it's an annual application of this particular uh, amendment. And essentially there is no impact of organic amendment dose uh, from these studies on the, on the average yield. And that's, that holds for both particular um, uh, sets of controls. What is very interesting I found is that where the organic amendment is applied in conjunction with an N fertilizer. So we're just looking at N fertilizer only. Where there's no fertilizer applied compared to the control, that dose between 100 and 200 units of nitrogen per hectare gave a very significant increase in yield. So we've you know, more than doubled the yield compared to a, a zero fertilised control. Where we've had organic amendment in combination with the end fertiliser at 100 to 200 units per hectare. Where we have no additional end fertiliser, we've actually got a, a, a small decrease in, um, uh, in, in, in yield. Well, there's still an improvement compared to the control, but it's not as great as, uh, as the main treatment. This particular data set is having a look at the impact on yield compared to the initial starting properties of the soil. So we're having a look at available potassium, available phosphorus, and I think that particular test was the, uh, they, they standardized everything to an Olsen available P. We had a look at the initial nitrogen content. We had a look at the initial soil organic carbon content and the initial soil pH. So what's quite interesting here is that where the soil started with basically quite high fertility, so more than 0.2% nitrogen, more than 15 milligrams per kilogram of uh, Olsen available P, and more than 100 milligrams per kilogram of available K, the actual improvement in yield wasn't that great. So certainly with, um, with initial high nitrogen, the organic amendment, so if the soil starting properties had high nitrogen, the organic amendment essentially did nothing uh, according to this data set, which, um, which to me indicates that, that where you have a highly fertile soil, or a, or a highly capable soil, maybe the organic amendments aren't going to have a huge effect in that particular situation. On the flip side of that is where your available phosphorus is quite low, so below five milligrams, where your soil organic carbon, sorry, where your nitrogen is below um, 0.1%, you've got very significant increases in yield. So in this particular case, where, where the available P was low, the organic amendments actually resulted in a fourfold increase in yield. 
So that's uh, definitely a result that uh, we need to keep in our mind. Again, to go along with that data, where our soil organic carbon was below um, 10 grams per kilogram or 1% basically, that's where the organic amendments tended to have the greatest impact. And interestingly, a bit of an unexpected result, the organic amendments appeared to have the greatest impact in fairly neutral pH soil. So the impacts were average or slightly lower in acid soils, but where you had uh, initial soil pHs that were neutral, it appeared that the organic amendments had the greatest impact. If we look across to the right hand side, again, where we're matching the organic amendment to a fertilized control, basically the initial soil properties had no impact whatsoever on, uh, on the outcome of the organic amendment. Okay, I'm gonna step away and have a look at something slightly different here, which is the impact on soil organic carbon. So I guess as a practitioner, what we're trying to do is obviously improve yield, but in the back of our mind, we're also quite interested in, uh, in improving our soil organic carbon for many purposes. You know, we know that greater soil organic carbon uh, can mean a, a more capable soil, but down the track, there might also be opportunities for, um, uh, for carbon credits, for example. I won't go into that aspect now. Oh. Okay. The key point here is where organic amendments were applied to, and compared to a zero or a nil fertilized control, we had roughly a 50% increase in soil organic carbon um, over that 10 to 20 year period. Where the organic amendment was applied compared to a fertilized control, um, the net effect was around about 35%. Um, okay, what we're having a look at here now is in this particular, um, okay, so sorry, the average difference in soil organic carbon that we're seeing here is actually not that easily explained. It could be because the control with no nutrients, which is this side, starts actually from a lower base. So it's well recognized that nutrients are needed for plant production, which drives soil organic carbon. And, and this is you know well recognized. You can go back to some of the early work by Yin Chan, for example, in soil research in 2009, where you had a look at carbon stocks under pasture. So on the flip side, where nutrients are applied to the control, which is this right-hand side, the changes to soil organic carbon are mostly due to the organic amendments alone as a crop or plant production is actually not significantly different. So these particular improvements um, to soil organic carbon are due to the organic amendment. And I believe that this additional benefit up to 50% is due to both a combination of the organic amendment plus the improved productivity. So we've now got additional carbon being supplied into the system through um, greater root activity, greater rhizodeposition, and probably now greater um, soil microbial activity driving some of that. If we're having a look at the impact um, of time, again, on soil organic carbon, and I made this point earlier with yield, that the longer the practice is, 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 um, uh, is done, the greater the impact on yield, uh, on, on soil organic carbon. Here we're look, having a look at, uh, at data from studies that are greater than 20 years old and studies that are between 10 and 20 years old. Even with um, controls comparing to fertilized, uh, 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 the treatments compared to fertilized controls, the longer you do the practice, the greater the impact on soil organic carbon. It's a pretty simple message, that one. And we're gonna break down the impact on, on, of the organic amendments on soil organic carbon uh, compared to the initial soil properties. So as with yield, if we're having a look at data sets with high initial phosphorus content, high initial nitrogen content, and high initial soil organic carbon content, 
the actual change in yield is a lot lower than that average change. So again, this to me indicates that the, the more capable soil, the more fertile soil or soils with organic carbon above 2% will tend to benefit to a lesser degree than the poorer soils. Exactly the same thing was shown when we compared it against uh, uh, a fertilised control. In this particular case, you know, we're only just seeing slight increases in, uh, in soil organic carbon content, where we starting with more than 2% soil organic carbon or more than 0.2% um, soil organic nitrogen. So we've got, uh, got some interesting points there. And again, on the flip side, and this was also shown for yield, when we have a look at, having a look at changes in organic carbon, the poorer soils, the ones with um, that tend to have uh, low organic carbon content, so below 1% organic carbon content, the soils that have low nitrogen content and the soils that have low available phosphorus content is where you tend to get the greatest impact on so changes in the net changes in soil organic carbon. So again, here, I think the role for organic amendments is probably most important in some of the poorer soils. Again, what was quite interesting um, was that the initial soil pH also showed that where we have this uh, neutral soil pH is where we tended to have the greatest effect on soil organic carbon. That, again, that was a bit of a surprising result. Um, I don't think we can explain that fully, but it's certainly something I think that uh, that we need to explore in some more detail. And I'm having a look here at the impact on microbial biomass carbon. So similar to the changes in soil organic carbon, when we're comparing to a nutrient starved control, the impacts are greater than comparing to a matched nutrient control. So again, we've got a 50% increase in microbial biomass carbon here, and where we're comparing it to a nutrient match control, it's around about a 30% increase in microbial biomass carbon. Basically, we couldn't decipher any of the, 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 those um, key aspects for, um, uh, for or, or, or the particular, um, the breakdown of what might actually be changing the microbial biomass carbon. So again, years of application didn't really have a major impact. The organic application rate, interestingly, didn't really impact on the biomass carbon and the organic matter type didn't necessarily impact on the, on the um, biomass carbon. What you'll note here is that some of our factors have, uh, have decreased. So um, we can only see three factors here, so straw, biosolids and manure. And the reason for that is that not all of the data sets had a look at microbial biomass carbon. So our, our, our number of comparisons here are starting to become a little bit weaker. What was interesting though, and I mentioned before that pH, soil pH actually impacted uh, the, the results for biomass carbon. So where we had an alkaline soil, and again, a, a, a neutral soil, is where we had the greatest impact on soil microbial biomass carbon. Right there. And where we had acid soils, so slightly acid soils, pH 5.5 to 6.5, the actual impact on, um, on microbial biomass carbon was slightly lower than the, uh, than the net effect. And this is the last set of meta-analysis that I'm going to bore you with. Um, it's a, basically having a look at the, the role of these organic amendments on soil phosphorus status as measured by the Olsen P. And we'll sort of, I guess, skip straight down to the, uh, down to the main data point here is where we have the lowest initial available P, which is below five milligrams per kilogram, is where we have the greatest impact on soil available phosphorus. It kind of makes sense really, where, where we're adding uh, uh, organic amendments, usually with, uh, with you know, a nutrient content um, is where we tend to have the greatest impact on, uh, on, on the net result in soil. So I'm gonna sum up here with a few key considerations. 
So the meta-analysis from, uh, from Marta Camps, Barwent and Chen in 2018 has shown the importance of nutrient supply from the organic amendments as a key driver of yield. The nutrient content of the organic amendments is highly dependent upon the source and nature of the organic amendments. So you go back to a classic paper by um, uh, Quilty and Steve Cattle in 2011 in Soil Research, and they define really nicely the, the nutrient contents of a very wide range of, of organic amendments. And in this particular uh, issue, uh, Mukai did a study in, um, in the Rift Valley in, um, in Africa and basically uh, has shown that even the same source of organic amendments can have vastly different nutrient properties. And, uh, and that's an important point for my next slide. So nitrogen content from the organic amendments is largely regulated by the mineralization rate of the organic amendments in the soil. And here, soil condition plays an important role in this mineralization rate. So we kind of have um, you know, two sides of the sword here. One is we've got an organic amendment that can mineralize and supply nitrogen, but for it to do so, there has to be a, a degree of microbial activity in soil or certainly conditions in the soil that will favor mineralization. And that might be more neutral pH, for example, an adequate amount of, uh, of, of labile carbon being supplied by the organic amendment, but also that starting base of, uh, of soil microbial activity. And also organic amendments on the whole improve soil condition as measured by soil organic carbon, microbial biomass carbon and available P. So we've got the organic amendments improving soil condition, but the analysis is also showing that it's the nutrient content of the organic amendments that are the key drivers of yield. So some of the key opportunities here that I've, uh, that I've identified is that if we persist with the practice, the longer the practice is implemented, the greater the effect. And that was shown by quite a number of authors in that, uh, in that special edition. Organic amendments can increase the use efficiency of co-applied fertilizers. So Simon Eldridge's paper shows that and, uh, and the editorial uh, gives a bit of a, a description of, of some of those mechanisms for um, improved use efficiency of co-applied fertilizers. Organic amendments have the greatest effect in soils with a low nutrient status low soil organic carbon and neutral or alkaline pH. So I guess one of the considerations here is, you know, do we look at you know, co the co-application of lime with an organic amendment to ensure that we're, uh, we're looking at more neutral uh, pHs to get these improved effects? And I just don't know if, if we've got an adequate amount of information on that yet to, 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 to really make that conclusion. But I would certainly like to see some more studies where lime is co-applied because we do know from that meta-analysis is when the soil pH was neutral or slightly alkaline, um, certainly we had the greatest impact on yield and greatest impact on, uh, on soil properties. Stocks of mineralizable nitrogen build up over time with organic application. Again, this, this long-term study from the Rift Valley has shown that. While when farmers apply chemical fertilizers, as one would expect, you've got that immediate effect on, on yield. So again, I think this, uh, this whole notion that if, if we're gonna be applying organic amendments, it has to be seen as a long-term practice. Uh, often when we just do it for a single season at a low dose, we might be somewhat disappointed with the results that we get. And one of the other um, aspects that, that came out is that we definitely need to have better tests um, to both analyze the nutrient content from the organic amendments, but also better tests to predict the mineralization rate of the organic amendments once they make it to the soil, because that really is one of the key drivers, I think, of the impact on yield. Thanks everyone. Sorry for boring you with lots of data. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. Uh, that was really good. I think the, um... The lots of data is enables us to give a really good overview and um, we can see where and when organic amendments may or may not be of use. I think there's value in that. We now have time for questions or comments of Lucas. Sophie Lapsley has said, the problem with trials like this is that we do not reflect what the farmer can save by a reduction of fertiliser to get the balance from 
from effect of the organic amendments and maintaining production. We found the same results when the controls or standard management was followed, but where management practice was changed to match the organic amendment, then you could see savings in nutrient application and water application. Yep, and, and certainly one of the, the things that the meta-analysis you know, from these 134 odd studies internationally has shown is that um, you know, the organic amendments definitely apply nutrients where the that nutrient might not be balanced, for example. So not all organic amendments are, are the same. So where that um, where the, the, the nutrients might not be balanced, the co-application of fertilizers with the organic amendment uh, has been shown to have a, a significant positive benefit. And what has also been shown is that the use efficiency of those co-applied fertilizers goes up. So that means you get better bang for your buck when you do use fertilizer in combination with the organic amendments. So I think uh, you know, that's where my point of, you know, we need to better understand and make it cheaper and easier for practitioners to know what the nutrient content of the organic amendment, amendments are, so that they can make these decisions around the need for co-application of chemical fertilizers if needed. Um, but also we need to understand what that mineralization rate is going to be. So for example, if you've got an exceptionally stable organic amendment that mineralizes over uh, nine months and you know, it supplies most of its nitrogen between month six and month nine, if you've got a 90 day corn crop, um, it's not that relevant. Um, but you know, if you're looking at it for a, for a long-term uh, crop or a you know, perennial tree crop, for example, um, you know that that longer rate of mineralisation may be uh, may be important. And get, just going back to that question as well, as I mentioned earlier, there are always exceptions to the meta-analysis. These are average data from 134 you know, international studies, and as I mentioned, there are always exceptions and deviants from uh, from 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 those means. And there will be definitely specific examples where results can be quite different to those that, that were shown in the meta-analysis. And I think further to that, Steve Kimber's made a, um, a point around that saying that the improvement um, in soil helps production in, in tough years. So there's also that uh, aspect of resilience, which is often um, masked or uh, leavened out by the looking of, at lots of data over many years. So there's that as yeah. well. Yeah, no, and Steve, that's a great point as well. And yeah, we do know that you know more capable soils and soils with generally higher carbon content do definitely tend to be more resilient to stress factors, you know, which might be you know, dry conditions, it might be flood. Um, you know, these stress factors might be compaction, for example, as well. Um, so you know, some of those aspects weren't actually looked at in this meta-analysis. Um, there probably just isn't that quantum of data available internationally mm -hmm. to be able to do a meta-analysis on that. You know, for, for an effective meta-analysis, you need to have a significant weight of evidence you know, across uh, uh, multiple studies to, to be able to do them effectively. And yeah. that and the I problem with that, then, yeah, it actually limits the, the types of comparisons that you can do. And I think also I was talking to Jason Condon um, at Charles Sturt University the other day about something else and he mentioned too that it's very difficult sometimes to tease out those issues of resilience because you're uh, particularly related to climate stuff because you're not sure what the climate's going to do from year to year. That's that's nothing that is under your control. <laughs> exactly. And I guess what, what, why, while while you've got got us nicely sidetracked here, Abby. Um, you know, the, <laughs> just put a plug in for the Soil CRC there, having a look at so a project that uh, Griffith University, led by um, Mayran Rashti, is having a look at, uh, I guess, analytical techniques to better uh, assess soil resilience. So up until now, we actually don't have too many soil resilience measures for soil. Um, so they're actually looking at some uh, some better ways of quantifying and putting numbers around resilience. And the particular stress factors that they're having a look at are uh, drought or, dr or drying soil and compaction. And um, one of the PhD students there 
has already got some nice data around uh, around the role of organic amendments in um, in mit mitigating uh, the effects of compaction. Okay, oh, that would be interesting. Maybe we'll have uh, invite one of them to have a have a chat on our coming SNOC webinars. Um, but going on to the questions, back to the questions, Justine Cox has said that her, the pH uh, story is intriguing and she says, do you think that it may be related to microbial habitat preference? Yeah, yeah, look, as I said, I, 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 I was unexpected, you know, I, those results were unexpected to me. Um, I didn't think that pH was going to have a that, that greater role, especially that pH 5.5 to 6.5, which was quite a bit lower to 6.5 to 7.4 in that comparison. Um, I would have thought that uh, yeah, there's adequate microbial activity in that slightly acid range, but the data has definitely shown that uh, the neutral soils and the slightly alkaline soils uh, tended to have a greater response to you know, varying factors, including microbial activity as measured by uh, biomass carbon from the organic amendments. Uh, it could be that uh, that those neutral pHs uh, tend to favour um, soil microbiology compared to the slightly acid, uh, acid pHs. Uh, again, I really mm -hmm. don't have an answer for that. And I think uh, it's definitely one that we need to sit around and pontificate a bit more on. <laughs> I had a query that was slightly related to that too, because you talked about co-application of lime with your organic amendment. And given yeah. that we know that, that lime, uh, the application of lime, um, it can take a while for that to have an effect on pH. Do you uh, think that the application of the lime with the organic amendment would actually help the action of the, of the lime as a liming agent? Like, is that a benefit as well? Yeah, so you've got two two amendments there that that both tend to have a slightly longer uh, longer term effect, I guess. Um, you know, the organic amendments, uh, you know, as was shown in this particular uh, meta analysis, tend to have a great effect effect when they're used over many years, um, mm. and uh, and when when it's applied annually, I think there's some good opportunities to co-apply the lime. Again, I'm not sure what the interaction between the lime and the organic amendment is going to be, but by increasing the pH of the soil, we know in general that's a good thing to do. And I won't go yeah, into yeah. that because you know, that's a, a, a separate topic altogether. But uh, yeah, if we can get that pH in that favourable range, um, yeah, it's shown here that uh, the organic amendments tend to have a, a better impact. So again, yeah. I, I've just identified that as an opportunity. Um, I don't know if there are any studies that that do that particular that that do mm. that particular um, assessment. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lena Liu has said, "Thank you for a great presentation. Does the study include chemical analysis of the different organic amendments? You know, the nutrient levels, pH, all that sort of." So the meta-analysis itself didn't um, have a look at the at the various. Um, all the detailed chemical analysis of the organic amendments, but all of that data uh, is within the original papers. So you can go back and have a look at the 134 studies that were um, that were analysed in that uh, meta-analysis, and the majority of them will have will have at least some analysis of the of the uh, of the organic amendments. Again, um, yeah, you know, there are a plethora of ways that soils and organic amendments can be analysed, you know, quite a wi wide range of, of methodologies. So if you look at one like available phosphorus example, um, you, know, you can use uh, Olsen available P, more commonly in Australia we use Bray or Colwell P. Um, you, know, you can have a look at Albrecht P and it, it all depends on, on, on the calibration set and what's most appropriate for your particular soil. But uh, yeah, certainly available P was had a look at, you know, was investigated in, in most of these organic amendments. And um, and again, it, it it really indicates that we need to have a better understanding of, of what the what the analysis of the organic amendments are. And you, know, you look at a study by Mukai, for example, where they did some detailed analysis of the organic amendments in their particular study over 10 years in the Rift Valley. You know, they had a look at manures. And it was quite interesting, uh, you know, looking at the at the range of 
available phosphorus in those manures. So it's the same source, but every year the analysis came back quite different from those organic amendments. So it, it, it really indicates that we need to have cheaper, more rapid testing of nutrients in organic amendments to, uh, to I guess, optimise the, the outcomes. Yeah, and I think that I've said this before too, that the thing about um, thinking of an organic amendment as a stable a substance that'll just stay as it is the moment that you see it to the next is not true. It's, a, it's yeah. not like that. It's got living things in it. And so it's constantly in flux, I guess. So that's a different mindset. Steve Kimber's asked another question about, um, he said, are you aware of any practices that could stabilise the organic amendments to improve long-term soil carbon? Yeah, certainly there are uh, ways to stabilise carbon from organic amendments. But again, that, those particular practices change the properties of the organic amendments. So you know, you've got composting, for example, which we know can, at, when it's applied to the soil, is probably a more long lived amendment than applying the, the raw product. But the composting process itself loses carbon and CO2 during that composting phase. And you have a loss of nitrogen during that composting phase as um, um, often as either ammonia or nitrous oxide. And there are lots of studies, you know, sort of showing that mess balance. Or you can go right to the extreme and have a look at uh, you know, pyrolysis or gasification technologies where you can uh, you know, get quite stable aromatic condensed carbon from the products. But again, during that process, you have a loss of carbon as, as CO2 or methane, and you have a loss of some of the nutrients during that process as well. So there are definitely ways to enhance the, the ability of those organic amendments to provide stable carbon into soil. But uh, I think the results from this particular study of the organic amendments has really shown that it's the nutrient aspect of the organic amendments that tends to have the greatest impact on yield rather than the effects on, uh, on, on carbon content of soil. Okay, thank you. I'll just mention that um, uh, as you can see on that slide in front of you, there um, is a bit of a back catalogue of the recorded webinars and you can um, access them in two ways. You could go to the um, DPI's YouTube channel directly and there's a playlist there or you can go to the DPI uh, soils pages and look at the particular area that you're interested in and um, there are various uh, recordings there that link into that YouTube channel or you can use the go to stage which is where the um, unedited and untranscribed versions sit with uh, uh, go to which is the platform we use. would like to thank uh, Lucas for the presentation as I said I think it's really good to get a really um, big overview which those sorts of meta analysis allow us to do and uh, thank you all for attending today and we hope to see you next month so thanks very much.